do live, but I'm not going to demand it. I'm just saying this is like my inclination. <laughs> and then the second thing I want to say is it's it's never a good start to look at your first slide and see a mistake. Uh, obviously, this is not the national consensus meeting. Do apologize. I do know where I am. Right, so the story I'm going to tell today is uh, a story that actually did this people when we went for several years in my life. And it's focused on what is a overall a very simple reaction, airing alkylation or airing alkylation. It's a reaction that's commercial, practiced on a scale of billions of pounds per year. And obviously it's an importance. So you know, one can ask the question, why on earth are we interested in an alternative route to make alkyl or alkene areas? And I hope to convince you that there's some potential value in the alternative route that we and some others have been looking at. So first, let's start and talk about how alkyl areas are currently made. And the, the vast majority of routes, commercial routes, are acid-catalyzed routes. No doubt, most or everyone in this audience recognizes this. Uh, originally, alkyl areas were made with one of the oldest catalytic reactions, the Friedel Crafts reaction, where the combination of Lewis acid and Ronsted acid is used to activate an almost incredible lactophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, predominantly in the 80s, zeolites came on board, acidic zeolites. They have obviously some uh, substantial benefits compared to the traditional Friedel Crafts reaction, uh, including longevity and catalyst recycling, et cetera. Uh, these are really useful commercial catalysts, but I'll make a point that they do have some intrinsic issues that I think alternative pathways might be able to address for common. And I'll, I'll just comment on a couple of them here. One is polyalkylation is a persistent problem. The alkyl arenes in acid-based catalysis are typically more reactive than the starting materials, so high conversions and high selectivities is a significant challenge. Regioselectivities for substituted arenes is typically not catalyst controlled. There are some shape selective strategies where the catalyst can be used to control that selectivity, but in general, orthometapara selectivity for substituted arenes is dictated by well-known selectivity rules we learn in salt and organic chemistry, and is dictated by the electronics of the substituent, and often not by the catalyst. The uh, opportunity to generate unsaturated products in situ is virtually non-existent with acid-based catalysts. So I'll show you the route to styrene in just a minute. We might want to make styrene in one step. There's some potential advantages to that. But with acid-based catalysts, that's often not possible. Very challenging. And then finally, with substituted alpha olefins, acid-based catalysts are generally highly or 100% selective for incorporating the, the aryl group internal to the alkenes, so two or three are substituted. Uh, it's actually quite surprising. Making one aryl alkenes from the aryl and alpha olefin in a scalable fashion, large scale, is something that, uh, to my knowledge, is, is not feasible. Awesome. Okay, so this is the mature catalyst technology. What are the possible benefits of the new approach? Well, I've just touched upon them briefly, but I want to just highlight this in a little bit. Uh, so shown here is, is sort of a simple overview of the current route to make stock. Now, it is a, obviously a bit of a simplification, but essentially the reaction involves uh, benzene ethylation, and there's polyethylation. Distillation allows purification of the ethyl benzene. The polyethylated products are combined with benzene or transalkylation catalysts to optimize the yield. And then there is an endothermic dehydrogenation step to make stock. So it's a multi-step process, and perhaps if you were designing a process from scratch, this is not the route to start that you, you might envision. Um, I would argue that it would be a, a more efficient, direct route, and perhaps one that could come with substantial energy savings, is the conversion of benzene, ethylene, and oxygen as the oxidant directly to styrene instead. But with acid-based catalysts, it's generally not a viable or accessible. Also, I mentioned this previously, but with substituted areas, and I've just shown alpha benzene as an example, the ability to control orthometa paraselectivity with the catalyst is a significant challenge. With organometallic catalysts, 
homogeneous catalyst, this becomes an opportunity or possibility. And there's some potential products that one might want to make that are counter to the selectivity from acid base catalysis. And then finally, also noted with alpha olefins, the ability to make the one substituted alkene, in this case, a one phenylpropane, is a real challenge with acid base catalysts. All right, so what's the route that we and others have been working? Well, it's traditional organometallic chemistry, only from years and years of research in CH activation and olefin insertion chemistry. And the route basically it starts with a metal arrow, coordination of the and then insertion of that olefin into the metal arrow. A reaction that occurs with hundreds, if not thousands, of different transition metal complexes. Lots of precedent, lots of understanding of that reaction step. Here there's an opportunity to control linear branch products. So that terminal substitution versus the internal substitution. The product that insertion is potentially susceptible to beta hydroillumination, which provides a pathway to make an unsaturated alkenal area in a single catalytic cycle, rather than isolating an alkyl area in the hydrogen. Further, if we want alkyl areas, the ability to control the pathway possibly. Beta hydroelimination versus a straight CH activation to the insertion product gives us an opportunity to design catalysts that give us, in some cases, saturated products, but in some cases, unsaturated alkyl areas. So we've got that, that potential for tunability in our white blood catalysts. And then finally, in the CH activation step, whether it occurs from here or from some intermediate from the beta hydroelimination after that step, it provides us an opportunity to control orthometapara selectivity. Or other types of selectivity and substituted areas. Right, so, I've just shown here some of the individuals who have been working in this area. I'm not going to talk in great detail about the components of the folks in my group's work, but I did want to highlight uh, a few years ago, Bill Goddard and Lloyd Cariona uh, did a lot of work with this iridium free catalyst precursor. Alex Bell and Don Tilly have worked with platinum precursors, as has Karen Goldberg. Uh, our group has done some uh, platinum chemistry. I showed one example of the class of complexes we used here. I'm not going to talk much about our platinum chemistry. I'll maybe briefly mention it in the arc of the story. And then recently, John Hartwig has uh, published these really interesting nickel catalysts, really large, bulky NAC weapons. An advantage of those catalysts is they give high selectivity for linear products. The disadvantage in terms of the activities is they're very sluggish. They give very few turnovers for most holes, most conditions. Okay, so the, the arc of my group story is shown on this slide. We started with ruthenium catalysts. I'm going to quickly go through some of the backstory. This is, for us, pretty old chemistry, and we've not done a lot with ruthenium recently. But what we've learned from that, in terms of some of the global conclusions, and the arc of our story, I think is important. I'm, I want to talk a little bit about that chemistry, what we understand about the chemistry. Uh, we then moved to platinum, and we published a lot of chemistry with platinum. I'll just briefly say we could not prevent platinum from eventually going to platinum black, no matter what we did. And so while we could tune the platinum catalyst, we could make styrene in some cases, alkylarity in other cases. We got some pretty good catalysts that give us hundreds of turnovers. So this chemistry for us at that time was impressive. Um, we never could get to thousands of turnovers in you know, days and days of, of long-lived catalysts. And platinum always comes way down to platinum black. So, I'm not going to talk much about that. We published about a half a dozen papers in this area. But then more recently, we moved to, to palladium and rhodium. There's some similarities here, but also some important differences. In the last part of my talk, I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, the similarities, but also the contrast with palladium and rhodium. And the reason I've uh, made rhodium a bigger block uh, here is because it's, it's been magic for us. Rhodium has just been a superb catalyst in, in many ways. All right, let's start with the ruthenium story. So our Studies began with these octahedral saturated ruthenium 2 complexes supported by hydrogen browsing and break. Uh, don't worry so much about the ligands. One thing I want to note is that we have this ancillary ligand here, which we could vary among CO, phosphines, and other two electron donors. So we can vary the sterics and the electronic donation, and hence the electron density of the metal center over a very wide range. In fact, for the ruthenium catalyst, we look, we had, we look at reversible free tube potentials. We had over one volt. Difference. So, really large range, just varying that ligand, or going from a, a borate to an alkene and getting the cation complexes. 
Um, and here are uh, some of the students that, that worked on this chemistry. Uh, again, I'm not going to talk in great detail about this chemistry. Uh, I just want to note a few things. One, they are selected for ethyl benzene over styrene in most cases, so we did not, for most conditions in catalyst, no ones get alkyl area, which is a big goal, of course. The rate of formation of ethyl benzene was about 7 to 10 pounds faster than diethyl benzene, which is opposite the typical relative rates with acid based catalysts, which we were excited about. We did get anti Lopatnikov selectivity with alpha olefins, but the selectivity wasn't great. It was close to, to one, a little bit better, one and a half to one, which at the time was a unique feature. There were very few catalysts with simple hydrocarbons that gave this kind of selectivity, but still the selectivity is not great. One thing we learned early on or convinced ourselves of is that the area of the CH bond breaking step is the rate limiting step of catalytic reaction. And we've learned that if we put more donating and ciliary ligands L, we could break those area and CH bonds faster. And so, of course, immediately we made as many ruthenium precursors that were more electron rich as we could, thinking we were going to have longer lived and faster catalysts. And that strategy absolutely failed. And what we didn't appreciate at the time that we now fully appreciate is that a key to the success of this catalysis is fast olefin insertion. So the more electron density you pumped into the ruthenium, the slower this olefin insertion step was. And we could, we could change the rate of benzene, benzene CH activation, delta, delta, G, delta, X, slowest to the fastest benzene CH activation. It was about seven tenths of a decal. So it made a difference in the rate of, of benzene CH activation. But the delta delta G double bag for all of the insertion is about 8 k cal, a really significant difference. And you might think if there's a metal that can break an aryl CH bond, an sp2 hybridized CH bond, surely it can probably break an ethylene sp2 hybridized CH bond if it has an opportunity to do so. In fact, it can. And when we slow the all of the insertion, what happened is ethylene CH activation began to peak. In some cases, it was the only reaction we saw. And then eventually funnels into these 83 methyl little complexes, which do not re-enter the catalytic cycle. They are thermodynamic states. Unless we fish them out, protonate the allele off, and then regenerate the catalyst beds in the chain. And so what we realized is that a key is not the CH activation step in terms of the catalyst the efficiency here. It's actually the opposite. We want to, we want to pull back on that thinking the olefin pi back donation, which inhibits the olefin insertion. So this was pretty simple to do. And in fact, we were able to make a range of precursors, and I've shown here a handful on this slide. Take the ruthenium 3 2 redox potential, the reversible potential, and this is shown versus NAG. We got a pretty reasonable correlation between that and the turnover numbers in four catalysis from halt. And, we, and, and the, and the deaggregation is nearly always formation of that methyl flow complex. So we can optimize the catalyst and eventually we get a catalyst, this cation here, which I'll show in the structure on the next slide, which would give us nearly 600 turnovers before it was fully deactivated. The problem was we could only push this so far. We made a ruthenium precursor that had a potential of 1.4 volts, but it found a way down to ruthenium zero. It was too electron efficient. And so we could only push this strategy so far, and we could stabilize our TV too. And this shows our, our best ruthenium catalyst, this cation with a brazzable alkane. Uh, we can get over 500 turnovers, so reasonably successful compared to our other catalysts. But for these ruthenium complexes, we could not stop that efficacy of activation. Insertion was too slow. And I do want to emphasize here, you know, challenge because. If we, we need all of the insertion to be fast. That is a critical factor. But if it's too fast, we're going to make linears of polymers. Important chemistry, but we want to avoid that. So there's a real narrow window here where you have to electronically design your catalyst so that it doesn't hold on to that ethylene too long to get the CH activation chemistry. But it's also not too fast. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention, I already said in the most conditions we didn't get out key pairings. And it wasn't because the beta hydride elimination is a slow reaction. This reaction for the ruthenium complexes is very fast, as you might expect. But it was a reversible reaction. We did some traffic experiments to, to demonstrate that. And so we felt the issue here was these are coordinatedly saturated, 18 electron complexes. And so just the rate of dissociation of the olefin is slow because of the pipe back. 
the same reason in some cases that insertion is slow. And so we, we felt like we needed to go to both less donating nodes and find nodes that were coordinatedly unsaturated so that we could have a different route to dissociate the styrene or other alkene layer. And so we're in the middle of the periodic table. We have two choices. We can go left to D0 metal centers. There's obviously no metal that will be high back bottom there. Our concern is that because those types of complexes are often polymerization catalysts that we have real uh, challenges stopping liquorization and polymerization. So we've not looked at any of the early metal D0 catalysts for this type of chemistry. It could be viable, might be able to design a catalyst, but we felt like that would be a challenge. So the other option is to go right. So this is what we've been working on for the past several years. And also, by going right, we felt like we could access rhodium one and iridium one, platinum two, platinum two complexes that prefer four coordinate and have an open coordination site. And we hypothesized that that would allow us to make alkenal arrows, provide a, a low energy pathway once we beta hydride eliminated, coordinate ethylene or some other role for whatever chemistry we're looking at. And have at least a low energy pathway to knock that out to the very product. And this just demonstrates with the Ruthenium 2 D6 complexes, we felt like this would be a high energy barrier, at least for Ruthenium 2, we knew it was. And so while beta hydroxylation is accessible, it's reversible under catalytic conditions. And so we don't get styrene and other alkylarines. We felt like with D8 complexes, we could have access potentially to this low energy associated displacement. Of styrene and other alkene variants. And so that was the next step in our progression. We first looked at platinum, as I mentioned previously, uh, and platinum did work for us. Platinum's in kind of an interesting position because some catalysts we would get saturated alkyl aerines, and we could tweak the ligands and watch the selectivity move to styrene and design catalysts that gave us predominantly styrene. So catalyst and platinum is a really nice spot for organometallic chemists for this chemistry. Because we could design the ligands to give ethyl benzene or styrene. The problem was every catalyst that we designed to make styrene, we would get one to two turnovers, and those platinum hydride intermediates, we believe, found a way to, to make platinum apply. And we knew that the activation, a uh, deactivation pathways were binuclear platinum, second order kinetics. We don't know the exact mechanism. We get platinum hydrides, two platinums come together, and we get solid platinum. And we tried everything. We would bulk up. The sterics of the ligands, lots of things. We probably looked at 30 or 40 different complexes, and they all have a way to platinum. So, from there, we decided to move to palladium rhodium. It felt it be a lower propensity to, to reduce down, or at least the palladium, but does get palladium zero. That reoxidation step is well precedent in coupling chemistry, so we felt like we could pull it out and play it. All right, so these are the students who have worked on the rhodium and palladium project over the past several years or are currently doing so. Uh, the chemistry I'm going to talk about mostly today is predominantly worn by Mark Bennett, a student still in my group. Uh, Mike Webster Gardner uh, is now uh, graduated and been working in industry, and uh, Wei Haoju also graduated. So our first hit came with rhodium, big hit, what we thought was a really successful catalyst. And we started with these diamine ligands that we could vary the arrow substitution here. Uh, and we are excited again because now we have a handle that we can tune the catalyst. So I'm going to tell you and show you the next slide is that ligand does not play much of a role in catalysis. I can't say that it plays no role, but it doesn't play a significant role. We don't need it. So, from the standpoint of an academic organic this is disappointing because we don't have that handle to tune the catalyst. But from the standpoint of a possible scale up of utility, Having no fancy organic ligand is a potential advantage, and we do not need that. Uh, one of the things we were really excited about two things. One is the in situ oxidant is copper two. I'll come back to that. And we have high selectivity under these conditions for styrene formation. So you can imagine we take an oxidant, olefin, late transition metal catalyst, and an aerate. There are a range of products you can get out. You can functionalize your olefin, you can dimerize your olefin, and liquorize your olefin, you can make steel beans, you can make alkyl earrings, biphenyl, you can go on and on. With palladium, under our initial conditions, we got a lot of those products. Selectivity was an issue. But platinum, the, the rhodium catalyst under these conditions is very selective for styrene. 
Now, I will admit these are very low conversions. If you go to higher conversions, we do start to make still beans and we do start to see some diamonds. But the intrinsic fat selectivity is for sour. Now, we were excited about copper two because using copper two as an mm -hmm. oxidant is, of course, commercial chemistry. I'll just highlight the ethylene oxidation process where copper dichloride is used as the oxidant, and it can obviously be copper one, and ACL can be reason to be oxidized by the oxygen, very fast cell reaction. And so the reaction that we are catalyzing bears some similarities to copper. So that's the net reaction after we recycle our copper two with dioxygen is benzene and ethylene, in this case, and oxygen, one styrene water, the, the reaction under one of my introductory slides. So we're really excited that copper works. I will say copper chloride does not work in this reaction. We think we understand why now. We thought it was the CH activation step. We think it's actually a low H coupling step that that carboxylate is, is key to this reaction. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, the, the copper also is, is really valuable to us because we can watch these reactions. They're just beautiful visual chemistry. We start with copper two, it's blue. When the reaction is about halfway done, it's this nice green color. When it's complete, we get a bronze copper one. Um, I have a video that I sometimes show. The recycling here is, is fast solid. We don't have oxygen in situ. We pull the reactions, we open up the air. It turns blue immediately. We can purge the air out of the cabin continue the, the reaction. So there's there's generally a few different ways we run these reactions. They're in batch reactions. Uh, we can run the reactions with copper only and then recycle with air at low temperatures to purge that air out. And my understanding there is a commercial variant of the vodka process that essentially does that. The copper's pulled out and recycled there and the copper is put back into the catalytic process. We can run the reactions with copper two and air in situ it works. The catalyst is tolerant to dioxygen. It slows the reaction down, so there is that disadvantage. And also, selectivity becomes an issue when you have O2 in situ. It can do things that once you start to build up products that are, for example, you get a So there's some disadvantages to that. And we can also run the reaction without buffering, only dioxygen. That chemistry is very slow, uh, but it does work and it is, it is catalytic. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about these catalysts is they do selectively make anti top products. I'll just note, if you look at the history of long chain alkyl airings years ago, these branch of alkyl benzenes were commercial products. Uh, these are sulfonated and used as surfactants. And then due to environmental concerns, linear alkyl benzenes, uh, such as two substituted long chain alkenes, uh, became commercial. Uh, but there's no commercial application of what we've been calling super linear alkyl benzenes to differentiate the linear alkyl benzenes. And it's not, I don't think it's because these compounds have no potential value. We believe there's some value to these compounds. I think it's because there's no scalable way to make these compounds with acid based catalysts, for example. And our rhodium catalyst makes the unsaturated variants of these compounds. And I've shown here we can just take simple, I, I noticed, I mentioned previously, we don't need the diamine ligands or any other ligands with rhodium. We can start with rhodium ethylene enriched by acetate in this case or other peroxidant salts. Here I've shown some data with propylene, and we get under these conditions about an eight to one, what we call linear branch ratio. We do get a mix of the vinyl and the, the little uh, linear products. Uh, the selectivity for anti-marcomacop to marcomacop depends upon the exact conditions, temperature, copper loading, some other factors, acid loading. It varies for our caps from about six to one up to about 18 or 19. So we can we have conditions where we get very high selectivity. So now I want to talk about what the catalyst is. And so for a while we were confused because our computational collaborator would calculate lots of different pathways of compositions with ODM based mm -hmm. atoms, you know, for box plates and other things. And we could get relative barriers that match some of our kinetics, but the barriers are always too high. And we think that's because the active catalysts actually embed copper into the most active catalysts. I will say, and I'll talk a little bit about this, the speciation is complicated through this chemistry. As you might imagine, 150 degrees Celsius, all of them rhodium copper carboxylates. I think there's lots of different things that are in solution. But we think this rhodium copper rhodium species is at least one of, if not the predominantly active catalyst in this reaction. 
And so we can mix this rhodium salt with copper tube. We can isolate this uh, mixed metallic species. We get a crystal structure of it shown here. We know that this we convinced ourselves it's a persistent solution. Um, you can see it by, by proton MR. In addition, we use uh, spin lattice relaxation times to estimate the distance between copper and the various protons. And you can look at the concentration effect and convince yourself that it's that is a single molecule and not soluble copper mixing with rhodium. And those distances we calculate for that are consistent with what we see in the crystal structure. You know, they're not exact, it's solution versus solid phase and there's some there. Uh, so we think copper is important to this, this reaction. Bill Bowers group, as I mentioned, uh, and Charles Musgrave and his group have done a lot of calculations, and it turns out their calculations with copper embedded into the rhodium fits pretty well with the energetics that we see in this reaction. So it's showing the mechanism they calculate, uh, and, and this is an abbreviation of the catalyst. So rhodium initially coordinates benzene, and the lowest energy pathway that they calculate is actually an oxidative addition reaction that they transient rhodium free has a slight advantage over the classics uh, conservative methylation reprotonation. And then a reductive coupling of OH to get coordinated acetic acid, which then can be released and then you go into the styrene, the rhodium hydride gas and copper generator oxidants. And I won't go into great detail, they've calculated the same pathway without copper. And the calculated highest energy transition states 32.6 kcal per mole above the starting material. So there's an obvious advantage. Uh, according to the calculations, we believe our salts are having copper embedded into that site. And, and part of that advantage is this reductive step. It might be as simple as having to put this acid in the gas to allow that to go. It could be Okay, so what about palladium? You can even plate in or right next to each other in the periodic table. We can take palladium acetate, throw it in just like rhodium acetate or carboxylate. So it turns out palladium will do this chemistry. And we have found conditions where the palladium is, is very selective. Not as selective as our rhodium, but it's, it's highly selective for styrene production. It, it's almost about to figure this out. Um, and I'll just show here some of the data uh, for palladium. This is percent styrene formation as a function of ethylene pressure and temperature. And it turns out the reaction becomes more selective at higher temperatures. And the reason for that is, and I won't go into the details, but one of the side products with palladium, perhaps not unexpected, is it'll activate ethylene to make ethylene acetate heavily, depending on what copper oxygen is. At high temperature, we in situ generate some palladium catalyst that takes benzene and the ethylene acetate and makes styrene. That reaction does not occur at low temperature. We think part of that is the catalyst that does it, and we think it's an element of palladium. We have some evidence for that. That requires 150 degrees Celsius or higher to access. So at low temperatures, and many people have previously, not many, looked at palladium for this chemistry, and it's unselective. But all the reactions we've looked at were 120 degrees, 100 degrees Celsius. And you need to go to that high temperature to get that final acetate to benzene to, to start. So there's one of the keys. Uh, we have looked at Mixing palladium with copper, and in fact, what we isolate is a mixed metallic species. In this case, we have one palladium and two coppers. This is a DMT calculated structure. We, we grow a single crystal, we have an x ray structure of this. We've done the same in situ in our studies and convinced ourselves that this species exists in solution, along with other mixed metallic species. We believe there's a palladium two copper one that forms. There's obviously probably some palladium without copper embedded. What we can't do is we can't do these same studies under catalytic conditions because at 150 degrees with an excess of copper, we can't see any of our signals. So we can only do these under conditions where we have some copper and palladium. So it's the calculations that convince us that these types of complexes are active catalysts that are important for the catalytic cycle, and it's our, our low temperature modeling studies, if you will, that experimentally convinces us that they're, they're likely forming an important. Okay, so we've, we've isolated a bis rhodium copper that we think is an active catalyst, a palladium bis copper. What about the reaction for We compare rhodium and palladium. They are between, so these are log log plots. They're one set of conditions. I will say the order in palladium and rhodium varies with conditions consistent with a complex mixture, complex speciation. 
The order for rowing is one and a half. The order for plate is one point. So the way we interpret this is that quite simply, we do have these species I just showed, the rhodium 2 Pocker 1, probably plate in 2 Pocker 1, rhodium Pocker 1, plate in Pocker 2, and maybe even some other mixtures we've not identified. And these are all catalysts, they're potential catalysts. And which one is the dominant catalyst depends on the condition and probably changing, you know, it changes in the reaction progresses. So it's very complicated, but the thing I want to say here is that the presence of the Lewis acid in that active catalyst we think is important to the, the activity of the catalyst. So when we remove that copper, even though we can see catalysis, it is much, much slower, consistent with all the DOT calculations. So copper is not just an oxidant in this reaction. It's playing a transient role in, in the active catalyst. All right, what about activity of rhodium versus palladium? Rhodium is long. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. In most conditions, it's the rhodium is, is about 20 fold more active than palladium. This is normalized to a single rhodium or palladium metric. How do we compare our catalyst activity to cut this complex speciation? We just normalize it to one metal atom. That's how we compare it. But rhodium is quite a bit more active. What about selectivity? Because I noted that you know, one of the values potentially of this chemistry is the unique selectivity compared to acid based catalysis. Well, both rhodium and palladium have those features. They give us anti-recombinant properties, and they give us unique ortho pair selectivity. It's different from acid-based catalysis. So I've shown here some examples of ortho pair selectivity. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all the data. You're probably thanking me. Um, the take-home message here is that both palladium and rhodium are metapair selective in almost all cases. And rhodium is less variable than palladium. As we change the electronic donor or withdrawing ability of the substituent, rhodium selectivity varies some, but not a lot. It's usually two to one meta pair selectivity. We believe it's sterics in statistics. We've got two meta pair, two meta protons, the mono substituted variant to one para. Rhodium very rarely accesses the ortho position. So we get meta pair selectivity, very unique compared to acid based catalysis. It's catalyst corrected not substrate specific. Palladium is similar, but it's more sensitive to the substitution. So we do see more ortho than palladium if we have an ortho para director. If we have an ortho para director, we get more palladium's uh, CH functionalization, or para CH functionalization with palladium than we do with rhodium. So palladium looks more acid-like than does rhodium. And I don't have slides on this, but the anti-macomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomacomac
but there's a kinetic and selectivity there. What are the differences? Well, rhodium is more active than palladium. It offers distinct orthometapair selectivity. It's more rigorous than palladium is. It's more selective than antimicrobial properties. And there's a periodic trend here, we believe. There's a sweet spot in terms of electron density. If you go too late in the periodic table, it's too electrophilic and too acidic, and it's more acid like, like palladium if you go later probably that bones. If you go too far left in the periodic table, the metal is, is too electron dense, and we shut down things like the polar conservation chemistry, which is which is obviously a problem. And I will just conclude by thanking, I've, I've tried to note the students as I've, as I've gone through the talk. Uh, we have benefited from many collaborations on this project. Uh, Tom from Dari early on did some Ruthenian calculations. I briefly mentioned some of Bill's work. Uh, Bill Shinsky has uh, been collaborating and consulting on some of this chemistry recently with us. Um, although he won't admit it, Bob Davis briefly worked on this project with us. Bob, go ahead and raise your hand. He's not even going to raise his hand. And uh, the Department of Energy Office of Science has funded this project for quite some time. And thanks again for the invitation. And if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to try to answer.